So our next part of the neurological examination is doing the cranial nerve examination, something that really worries a lot of people. My tips are to use a neurological exam sheet so that you can go through the tests in a logical manner. That can also help tell you what is wrong with the animal. And I'm going to share with you in the next bit of video some tips on making that easy. Our fourth tip is that assessing cranial nerves is actually easier and takes less time than you think. I tend to divide it into three main uh, parts. The first is assessing the vision and light reflexes. The next is assessing facial sensation and movement. And the final part is assessing the bulbar nerves. And I'm going to take you through those now. There will be dedicated videos to each part of this, but I wanted to have one place that we had an overall look at this. So vision and light reflexes. Uh, in um, many ways, these are assessed altogether because some of the tests are assessing um, both. First of all, we need to establish the animal can actually see. Um, and um, for that, I'm most likely to use a dropped piece of cotton wool. Quite simple, but it doesn't make any uh, sound. And the white uh, means that it's quite uh, visually apparent to colourblind animals. And also you can drop it from one side and the other so that you're able to assess one eye and um, and then the other eye. And, and this is another test which is often bypassed. You know, people jump straight to the menace response. But the menace response involves so many uh, pathways in the brain uh, and can be affected by many different things. It's important always just to establish whether the animal can see or not. And so whether or not they can see is, is, is associated with them tracking that object falling down. But we can tell this cat is likely to be able to see just in one simple picture here because we can see that it's uh, focused on this object. The menace response, as I've said um, just now, involves uh, a, a lot of the nervous system. So we have to have functional eyes. And again, we can tell from this picture that this animal is menaced by this hand coming towards it. We can tell by, by the posture, the position of the whiskers, the fact the cat is, is backing away. Of course, when you use a cat, uh, menace a cat, then it's important not to use a whole hand as being used in the the photo illustration only. Uh, we want to, to not use something that's going to create a wave of air and stimulate those whiskers uh, by um, uh, trigeminal means sensation. So uh, a finger is usually best for cats. Um, you'll need an intact eye, an intact optic nerve, intact visual pathways going to the occipital cortex. Then you need to have uh, intact white matter going to the motor cortex. Uh, then the motor cortex goes down to the facial nerve nuclei in the brainstem. This is influenced by the cerebellum and then the eyes will close. So a lot going on with the menace response. Make sure that you interpret it um, properly. Then we need a bright light. And this is very important. There's no point in getting out your very, very dim, um, uh, disposable uh, flashlight. You need something that you can recharge um, or put new batteries in to do proper uh, uh, vision and light uh, reflexes. Yes, you can use your expensive mobile phone um, for this as well, but uh, I, I, yeah, there's lots of cheaper alternatives, although many seem to prefer using their expensive mobile phones. So there's two here. The first is the dazzle reflex. Um, that's a subcortical reflex, so it's just that the eye closes when there is a very, very bright light. Um, and it, it can be useful to assess those visual pathways are in, intact in an animal where uh, they may not have other uh, responses. Uh, and the papillary light reflex, which is the pupil's response to a bright light, so to constrict the pupil, which is a brainstem reflex um, and doesn't involve the, the visual pathways. But there is some commonality to it in that they both require a functioning retina, optic nerve and optic chiasm. 
And it's important to look at the direct and the consensual responses I'm going to show you uh, in this uh, video. So in this cat, um, uh, this cat has a right sided. I'm telling you the deficit already um, because it's one of the more complicated videos I will show you. Um, it has a right sided deficit of the ocular motor nerve, and that is both the parasympathetic component that controls the pupil size and the um, um, muscles, extraocular muscles. Um, it also has a Horner syndrome also on the right side. And uh, what I'd like you to do is to observe the right eye here, even if I may be stimulating the left eye. So coming in here, we can see this, this Horner syndrome. This cat has an elevated third eyelid, um, but perhaps, and I'm having to keep the pupil, uh, sorry, the uh, pal uh, palpable aperture open, but perhaps you're surprised that the eye is not my more myotic, and that's because of the combination of three, uh, parasympathetic and sympathetic. So I'm going over to do a papillary light reflex on this eye. We can just see the pupil starting to constrict, but this is quite a scared cat. So it's kind of overriding that. So I'm taking my light in further to make it really bright. We can see the pupil constrict there, but you see there is not a consensual response there. So this eye is remaining mid uh, pupil. And that's because uh, of a lesion right here. So we're, we're affecting this cranial nerve here. Number three, the ocular motor nerve. And we also see this eye that we can see this eye is flicking here. This is the ocular vestibular or ocular cephalic response. We can see the movement of the eye keeping it central, but um, but uh, the other eye remains absolutely stationary. Just seeing that there. See, absolutely stationary, whereas the other one is moving. So this combination is giving um, uh, us a mid-sized pupil, a poor direct and consensual papillary light reflex of the right eye, um, no physiological nystagmus, no ocular vestibular reflex of the right eye. And we probably have uh, cranial nerves four and six also affected um, uh, uh, those, for those that are... Um, uh, are wondering that and the left is normal. Now for the same cat we're going to look at facial sensation and movement. Now this is a very very common area of confusion. Facial sensation is the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve 5, and facial movement is the facial nerve. And when you're doing your reflexes, you actually ass um, the, assess this. You're actually looking at both nerves. It's incredibly common that I get referred animals with a facial nerve deficit. And people are saying it's trigeminal because they get confused uh, and think that the trigeminal is affecting the facial muscles. It is not. The trigeminal is motor to the masticatory muscles. So looking at this cat here. And we can see that when we touch the medial and lateral canthus and the whiskers, that on the right side, we do not get a muscular contraction. Is it the trigeminal nerve or is it the facial nerve? Let's check the ear. Ah, ah yes, the, we have some facial movement there. And that is because the facial nerve is actually sensory to the inside of the ear canal. And so that is showing us that we do have the facial nerve uh, likely intact on that side. And this is a uh, trigeminal nerve deficit. So in this cat, we have a right sided lesion of ocular motor, trigeminal and also the sympathetic. We have the facial nerve intact because we have ear movement and sensation, sensation deep within the ear. And this cat's um, final diagnosis was lymphoma. Um, this cat had a feline um, um, uh, immunodeficiency virus, which is the reason for handling it with uh, gloves um, there, which is the most common. Uh, and lymphoma is the most common cause of multiple cranial nerve deficits in the cat. Now, some of you may be a bit... Uh, a bit confused with the sympathetic involvement there, or perhaps need an anatomy reminder um, because this is one of the more complex um, uh, anatomical pathways. First of all, I'd like to point out there is no involvement of the optic nerve 
uh, in this uh, in this cat. No involvement of the optic nerve. I'm stressing that because and this uh, again is very common that such an animal would be referred to me as having an optic nerve problem um, where actually this is completely spared. This is the second cranial nerve. Uh, and we just look at the anatomy here. So the sympathetic supply to the eye is coming out of, um, like all of the sympathetic supply, the uh, T1 to T2 spinal cord segments, um, a little bit of a relay in the thoracic ganglion, and then the cranial cervical ganglion, and then it joins the sympathetic supply to the eye. So it's actually traveling, so it joins, uh, I beg your pardon, it joins the, the trigeminal supply to the eye, the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve. And it runs with that uh, trigeminal nerve. And so you often see a Horner syndrome in combination with uh, an ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve. Um, and these nerves actually run together through the same foramen. And so it's not unusual for cranial nerves three, four, five and six to all be affected at the same time by the same disease because they're running very close together in the uh, skull base in the area which um, in humans at least is referred to the cavernous sinus region um, and uh, and then they travel through the same foramen so it's not unusual for them to be affected in the same disease process and, uh, um, uh, and the third nerve is obviously carrying the parasympathetic supply to the iris and um, and the uh, lens. Um, so next we move on to the um, the jaw tone and the bulbar cranial nerves, and this is assessed by opening the jaw. Um, so we we assess the tone when we open the jaw, the movement of the jaw, um, uh, the gag response, tongue movement, a look at the tongue for atrophy, and we also ask the owner about the animal's voice. So we see here we're trying to open the mouth. Uh, and actually the, the jaw has quite good tone here um, and uh, the video seems to be paused because of a lack of resource on my computer. It's going to start up again. Um, here we go again um, and we can see that the uh, animal has closed the jaw and had very, um, very briefly, hopefully we'll see this again here, um, there, so we have a normal um, gag and tongue movement. Yeah, it's not. We're not seeing it very quickly, um, but we can tell this animal is normal. Sometimes people ask, um, "How do you tell uh, in a more fractious animal?" Well, I don't necessarily open the mouth in a more fractious uh, uh, animal, um, but you should be able to tell whether the, the mouth is hanging open and whether the tongue is moving properly. For example, in our cat here. Um, that we saw um, having walking across the floor, we can see that this cat has normal sensation. See the eyes closing here. But here we can see that the, the uh, jaw tone is considerably re reduced and the cat is not able to uh, close their mouth um, uh, properly. She also has weak control of the eye positions with this tendency to to um, hold the eyes inwards. If it was a human, um, then uh, almost certainly would be complaining of double vision. And we can see that the cat's tongue movement is actually normal. So that in a nutshell is how you assess cranial nerves, looking at the three things, vision, light reflexes, then looking at facial sensation and facial movement, then looking at jaw tone and the bulbar cranial nerves, which are used for swallowing. Our next tip is how to use hopping and hemi walking to assess postural reactions. Hope to see you there.